I hope that you're I hope that everybody has had a very birdie day. It's a it's it's wonderful to have you all on board. And what's the most exciting time of the year? Uh, it's spring. All the migrants have almost all arrived. The the birds are, are breeding. They're singing. They're advertising. They're far more easy to see, and there's more of them around. So it's the perfect time for a bird count, which is why back in 2014, BirdLife Australia decided we needed to have a national bird count of birds in the areas where people live. BirdLife Australia, most of our work is involved in protecting threatened species, trying to, trying to stop extinctions of our amazing bird life. But we realised after lots of our assessing lots of our science programs and monitoring programs that one of the gaps in, in our knowledge, despite having a fantastic birds in backyards program and Ur which is now the urban birds program, is that we really didn't have enough data about our most common birds, the birds we see in our backyards and our local neighbourhoods in, in our cities and towns. In fact, we knew more about endangered species like orange bellied parrots and how their populations were going than we did about the birds that we see every day. And so knowing that there was so many people out there who didn't consider themselves hardcore bird watchers, who, but really loved interacting with their birds, we wanted a way for them to experience the joy and the, 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 just the fun of getting outside and, and looking at the birds in your neighbourhood and then sharing what you're seeing with us. And now that we've been going on for uh, for seven years, we're really starting to see some interesting results coming back from the Aussie Backyard Bird Count. And it's certainly something that we're looking to expand even more this year because we really want to build on Sorry, you've muted yourself. Sorry, apparently I muted myself. I don't know how that occurred. Uh, hopefully that was not for the whole spiel. <laughs> um, yes, we all have, welcome to welcome to 2021 where we have meetings from our our bedrooms and and offices. Uh, so yes, <laughs> the Aussie bird, backyard bird count is um, it is a snapshot. Once a year, an annual snapshot taken by, by ordinary Australians of what the birds they're seeing in the places where they live. It can be in your backyard, but it can be in your front yard, uh, in the back paddock, down the local park, at your school. And the information that we gather from that is really helping us fill those gaps in our knowledge. Uh, why do we want, well, we'll explain why we want you to do a bird count for us, but what's in it for you? Well, certainly the, over, the, over the past 18 months, we know from the, the amount of chat that we've had from people inquiring to us at BirdLife Australia, so many people have really connected with the birds in their backyards. In, in these pandemic times, especially when our movement in many of our cities has been restricted and we've been stuck at home, we haven't been able to move around the landscape, Having birds outside your window has been a real sell. I, I liken it to, it's like a real life timeline cleanser. Rather than doom scrolling the reality that we have, birds are the thing that just refresh our day, give us like little bright pops of colour and pure enjoyment during the day. And we certainly know from the feedback we've got at BirdLife Australia that a lot of people who would never in, ever in a million years have thought of themselves as bird watchers have really latched onto that connection with nature and found something really, really heartwarming and, and, um, and, and an expression of positivity in their day. And so we also saw it in the 2020 Aussie Backyard Bird Count, a huge increase in participation, uh, particularly interestingly in Victoria and Melbourne, where we had a 30% jump in people getting involved in the Aussie Backyard Bird Count. And given the year that we've had and the amount of um, connection that people have made with their backyard birds, uh, especially in New South Wales, but also Victoria and in various times around the country, we're really hoping that this year even more people will become involved 
in, in the bird count. And this surge of interest will translate into us getting a, an even better snapshot of what's happening with our birds this year. Uh, in 2020, we saw 108,000 participants involved in the Aussie Backyard Bird Count. They submitted 155,000 surveys and we counted 4.6 million birds. This year, we're hoping for increases in all of that. As I said, every count that you do, every survey is like for that picture that we get, that snapshot every year that we have uh, of our Australian birds. It's a pixel. You think of your, your survey as one pixel creating a clearer picture. And so that's why the more people we get from right across the canvas of Australia, we get a much clearer picture uh, uh, of what's going on with our birds. Now, today's session is essentially to introduce those who've never done a bird count before, how to use the app or how to submit your count. But even if you have used it in previous years, we've made a few tweaks to try and improve the experience and make it easier to use. So hopefully we can point those out for you as well. Taking part in the, the Aussie Backyard Bird Count is, it's pretty simple. All you need to do is have 20 minutes clear in your week. That's all we ask. If you wanna do more than one survey, you can do as many as you like in as many different places as you like to give us that, that example of, um, of that sample of what the birds are like in your neighbourhood. So it's 20 minutes. We, and in, people often ask, why have we chosen 20 minutes to do a count? And what we found, we use this a lot in our other uh, bird population monitoring through our bird data monitoring system. The standard survey that we use is a two, two hectare to 20 minute count. And we find that 20 minutes is in that sweet spot where you have enough time to make sure that you're seeing all the birds in one spot, but it's a law of diminishing returns. And sort of the research shows that if you count for longer in those 20 minute times, the, the effort that's put in is you don't tend to see that many more birds. After 20 minutes, you've usually seen about 90% of the birds that you're likely to see. And it's not too onerous a task to take 20 minutes. If you, know, you can do it at lunchtime or at breakfast or take a cuppa out on the balcony, and, and do your 20 minute survey. Uh, as I said, the data that we collect is from the Aussie Backyard Bird Count, gets analysed by our research staff at BirdLife Australia, particularly in conjunction with other programs we have in our Ur Urban Birds Project to give that idea of how our birds are going. Uh, this year, we are hoping to break not just the record overall for the bird count, but on Monday, we want to really kick it off with a bang and we're going for the, uh, for the record of most people counting birds in one day. Uh, last year, we had 25,000 people counting on the first day. So we really want to start things off on Monday with a, with a huge surge in sightings and really get people excited because what we do find, even though we have a fabulous uh, media team, and we, we get a lot of support from the media around the country. Often people only find out about the bird count in the last day or two. So we wanna try and get many, as many people on board as possible. Uh, and as well, as well as contributing to the, to the scientific data that we use here at BirdLife Australia, the, doing a backyard bird count it is a really rewarding experience. As I said, we've noticed through, through the pandemic, so many people have become really attached to their local birds. They've come to know those characters in the daily soap opera that happens outside our window. And there's a lot of research that shows that, uh, that, that being out in nature, just being outside can really give you a lift psychologically and, and give you emotionally. Uh, there's some fascinating research out of Europe last year that's showing that for every 10 species of bird in your neighbourhood, it's the equivalent boost in happiness of a 10,000, the equivalent of a, like a $10,000 pay rise. Um, and that was factored in for all sorts of uh, sociological and economic th things. And it was the people who live closest to nature, closest to a diversity of nature, which is best catalogued by the number of species that you can see, the diversity of species, that overall, their, their happiness index that they reported was much higher. So why not get uh, what we like to call the gateway drug to, uh, to, to nature-based happiness by doing a bird count? And it's also the gateway drug 
to getting involved in more regular monitoring, which is the backbone of what we do here at BirdLife Australia. Okay, so how do we do a count? That's probably what everybody is here for. Now, the easiest way, uh, there's two ways really, but the easiest way is if you do have a, a smart device, a phone or a tablet, is to go to your app store, wherever you get your apps from, and download the Aussie Bird Count app. It's a free app to download and it's fairly straightforward. Um, and so once you've got that, you then register. We'll go through that in, uh, soon. I'll show you a bit of a video on how to do it. But you, you register and when you go outside, as you say, it's 20 minutes to, to do your count. Find your favourite outdoor area. Uh, that could be your backyard. As I said, we, it could be down um, down the local park at the at the duck pond, down down the beach by the river, wherever you go during your day for your daily exercise. That that's a good spot to to uh, do your bird count. Uh, it, so it doesn't have to be a backyard. And in fact, we have had people submit counts from like the twentieth story of their apartment, like from the balcony on their twenty stories up in an apartment block. And it's amazing in Australia how blessed we are that we have such amazing and interesting and fascinating birds, even in our most built up cities. Those people, for instance, we've had surveys done in places like central Sydney, where people are still seeing birds like sulfur crested cockatoos from their window and rainbow lorikeets and many other birds. And if you're in central Melbourne, there's a good chance you might see the peregrine falcons that nest in Collins Street swoop, swooping past. We'd love to capture them in our, in our data for the Aussie Backyard Bird Count. You can use uh, the web form. And obviously, if you're going outside, you're not going to be necessarily taking your computer to enter it on the web. So you can go out and just do a quick 20 minute count using pen and paper and then come back and enter it in on the web form, uh, which we will also show you a bit later. You don't need binoculars. They can help. Um, they definitely help. And uh, certainly having a pair of Swarovski binoculars, which are our sponsors, one of our sponsors. And there's a prize for uh, Swarovskis for a lucky participant this year. Um, so if you register, uh, you, you can only win if you register your details. Um, so you can do a count and not register your details, but you aren't in a chance to win any of those prizes. But you don't necessarily need binoculars, but they do help bring the birds closer to you and without making, obviously without you scaring them off. Uh, now, as I said, this is, a, we had 100,000 people do the surveys last year. And before we started these, certainly the research that BirdLife Australia did, we did not have 100,000 people who regarded themselves as bird watchers. So the whole point of the Aussie Backyard Bird Count is introducing people who, who like seeing birds but wouldn't consider themselves bird watchers to still contribute to the body of scientific knowledge. You, and we've designed the app and the web form and, and the resources around it uh, so that if, if you're not a bird expert, you can still join in. Uh, and so, We'll probably, uh, um, might be a good time now to go, I'll talk you through the video, this video link uh, about, about how to use the app. Um, it's got a, a bit of a background music on it, but uh, I'll try and. So this should show you how simple it, it can be to, to use the app. We'll just, hopefully we are sharing screen now. Uh, the wonders of technology. And here we go, I'll get full screen. This is how to use the Aussie backyard. As I said, you get your phone, you download the app and you head outdoors. You tap and register your details here. As I said, you can't be in prizes unless you register. Then if you have your privacy services on, you, the arrow will drop. Otherwise you can put a pin and where you're doing your local your count. Then you press OK and get set. Start looking up and looking around. Once you see a bird you know, you can go through and click for a search. You can click through the birds that are common in your area or you can type it in 
if you know the name of the bird. You see there, if you've got magpie, it will come up in, in the list. If you don't recognize a species, this is where you go to the find a bird section. And that we ask for that if you can have the basics of size, shape and color. Just the basics and you enter them. As you can see here for this beautiful variegated fairy wren. Put the size, now you try and put the shape and then the general colors that you see. So we've got blue and brown there. And then it will come up with a list of possible suspects of what it might be. It won't always be the first bird, but you can scroll through that list. Once you've identified the bird, you then identify how many, um, how many you're seeing. If you've made a mistake, it's very easy to go back. And you keep counting until your 20 minutes is up. And then you tap next and it will ask you to submit your checklist. Now this year, one of the differences is that the counts will be editable. I said editable, not edible. Um, so we'll just stop sharing the video there and we're back in the room. And I need to cancel that and get out of the, so we don't start having Lady Gaga playing the next one up. Um, so as you can see, it, it's hopefully fairly straightforward from that video. But the big difference is this year that you can edit your video and uh, edit your, your bird count, which is really good. Because last year we had a lot of people realising afterwards that they'd accidentally hit you know, 200 birds instead of 20 birds or accidentally put the wrong species in or found out later they, they'd seen, they'd entered the wrong species. This time, this year, we are going to send you an email once you've submitted your account and you'll be able to check on that email and if you realise you've made a mistake, you can go back into the count and edit your count, which hopefully will mean it will save poor Joe from having to answer 5,000 emails from people writing to the Bird Week email account saying, oh, look, I saw three top knot pigeons, not 30. Can you change it for me? So hopefully that will make things a lot smoother for you. Um, so so that's, that's basically the way, the way through. Um, we, we do have, if you don't have a smart device or prefer not to download the app, as I said, you can enter your data through the website. Uh, we try to discourage people sending in their written forms because they tend with Australia Post at the moment in the pandemic, we, we don't tend to get them in time to be able to include in our assessment of um, and, and our vetting process. So we really encourage you to, if you can't do it on the app, to do it on the uh, website form. Um, and I think Joe is, uh, Joe, jo, oh, we're not offering paper forms this year at all. Um, so <laughs> that, that's another reason why the pandemic has, uh, has affected it because we, as Joe says here, we can't actually access national office to process the mail and process your count. So it will have to be entered through the web form. Uh, I, I believe Joe will put the link up to that web form, but I will share the screen again to just show you basically how, how similar or how it, how it will work. So if we, I'll just get, get that up now and then share the screen. Um, so we, we're now sharing, sharing the screen. Hopefully you can, you can see the, the screen here. So it's, Fairly similar, you submit accounts, submit your details. And again, if you don't submit your details, we can't have you in the running. And then you have the count location. I won't enter it because it's going to autofill my address and around for, for uh, post webinar drinks. Um, we, the, unfortunately, the COVID laws don't allow it. Uh, so you fill in your details and your location, and then you go down to the birds observed. If you know the name of the bird, you just simply type, type the name in. So you've seen a magpie, and then it gives you all the options. So say if you knew the name of, say you saw a dusky wood swallow. Um, 
type that in and it will keep just keep throwing up the options there. Very similar to how the app works. If you don't know what the name of the bird is that you're looking at, you can go, we don't, unfortunately, we don't have the fabulous find a bird option in, in the web form, but you can go to the Birds in Backyards bird finder. I won't go into it here because it'll just take a, that's a really useful guide for anyone on, on the web at any time to, to go how to identify the birds in your backyards. So that's basically it. And then once you've put in all your birds, uh, you need, if you've done a time, if, if you've done it on, uh, gone out and done your 20 minutes on paper, you make, need to make sure when you're submitting the checklist that you put in that you've done 20 minutes so that that registers. Because we wanna make sure that we have standardized bird counts because they're much more valuable. If people only put in the time it takes to fill in the form, we don't know whether you spent 20 minutes out there counting birds or just three minutes. And so therefore we don't know whether we got the full uh, count that other people have sent in. So that's, that's pretty much it. It's, it's very similar to doing it on, online on, through the app, but um, it, it's just not, um, you know, we, we, it's much easier with the app because you will get the email back and you can check on the app, uh, not just your statistics, but the statistics of your area and, and Australia altogether. So that's, uh, that's how that process works, um, which, which is uh, very, uh, very simple, hopefully. We've tried to make it as user-friendly as possible. It's not gonna be perfect every time because often birds don't look exactly like the photos that we show and it, it's not a, a foolproof system, but hopefully it's gonna be a really good way of guiding you towards the possibilities of what the birds are that you're seeing. It also means that you, um, the, the, the advance we've made this year is that we have automatically uh, put in the 30 most common birds seen in previous years in your area. So if you scroll through that, that might be the solution to the bird that you're not sure of, um, which, which can be really, really helpful there. Uh, we, I wanna talk quickly about what we've learned. Um, a lot of people really love participating with this and it's a great, a great thing to do a backyard bird count with your kids. My kids, they're, they're a bit sick of having dad as a bird, bird man as a dad. So they tend to shy away from the bird stuff. But this is one activity that they really get into because it's got that element of gamification because you're using an app. And especially when my kids were younger, they would love to come out for the only time in their lives and do a bird count with dad because they got to enter the data. Um, but it is a, a fun experience. We're trying to make it as fun and enjoyable as possible, but there is a serious side to what you're doing for us. And that is collating all of this invaluable data that we would never be able to fund ourselves, or government certainly would never, you know, th there's so little funding for endangered species, let alone trying to find out what's going on with common species. So stuff like this, the Aussie bird count, this citizen science is of immense value. And I just wanna to talk to you now about what that value is to bird life. And what we've been able to do over the last um, seven years, we've looked at the first seven years of data from the Aussie Backyard Bird Count and been able to take those snapshots and compare them year on year and see how they're changing. Stuff that we wouldn't necessarily notice, even through uh, some of our other projects. And having a good, dig through the data this year, we've, we've stumbled across some really interesting trends and quite some at times alarming trends. We found that our common birds are doing even better. The top two birds, the rainbow lorikeet and the noisy miner, the two most commonly seen birds across Australia's backyards, even though the noisy miner is not found in Western Australia or the Northern Territory and the rainbow lorikeet's not found in the Northern Territory, uh, they were the two most commonly seen birds and they're increasing uh, even over seven years in cities, particularly Melbourne, uh, the noisy miner has gone from a 25% reporting rate to almost a 40% reporting rate. So that really shows that that bird is still expanding its range and its numbers. And so we're seeing those bigger, bolder, 
more aggressive birds, uh, the birds that, that can really hold their own and the birds that really like what we're doing in our urban areas, in our streetscapes and our parks, where we have a lot of scattered big trees with lots of flowering eucalypts and grevilleas and bottle brushes and things like that, the big showy flowering plants, really attract those bold, aggressive, larger nectar feeders. What we're not doing well in our cities is providing habitat for our smaller garden birds. And this is something that we've picked up, a trend that's emerging from the data of, um, of the first seven years of the backyard bird count, is that some formerly very common garden birds that could be found in all of our cities are starting to drop out of places. And the reporting rates that we've seen over seven years, which is a really good measure of how the birds are going. So even though we get more people, uh, as we get more and more people counting, obviously the numbers that they're seeing will go up because there are more pairs of eyes out there. But the reporting rates are constant in the sense that it's the percentage of how many people are out there doing counts. And this year we were really quite concerned to find that what's emerging in most cities is a disappearance of those smaller birds. And the birds that we, we're pretty familiar with, like, like the fairy wrens, in, in cities like Melbourne and Sydney and Canberra, the number of fairy wrens that are being reported or the, the, how often they're being reported is dropping. In Melbourne, it was almost half as many, uh, the reporting rate dropped by almost half over seven years. The same thing in Perth for the splendid fairy wren. We know that these birds hang on on the fringes of cities and they hang on where there's uh, along creek lines and beaches where there's a lot of scrubby sort of habitat that they can survive in. And then they pop out into the gardens that uh, similarly have that dense understory. But the fact that we're starting to see less of them being reported is a real alarm bell. And it shows what we're doing in our local neighbourhoods is impacting our birds as we big build those big McMansions and we clear areas, tidy up and we, we don't have the sort of gardens that are nice and tangled and have a, have a good mid-storey and understory and ground cover. We're losing those little bush birds that still used to be able to survive in our urban areas, in our gardens. Another bird that we're losing seems to be the silver eye, which is a really hardy bird and yet it, it too is dropping in its reporting rate right across most of our cities. And then another bird is the willy wagtail, which the reporting rates dropped in every state and every capital city, except for Perth. And we think that that may be in Perth, we don't have noisy miners or the equivalent in Perth, the yellow throated miner, they're not invading the suburbs like the noisy miners are in all the rest of Eastern Australia. So perhaps the noisy miners are putting pressure on the wiggly wagtails. We don't know that for sure, but we're starting to get that impression. So that's why we have these sorts of things as we can start to learn and, and confirm the theories that we have. And now that we're looking at this stuff, we, can, we work with over 100 councils uh, sharing the data from, um, from the Aussie Backyard Bird Count. And those councils can start factoring in what they're seeing in their local government area into how they manage their parklands, how they manage their streetscapes, those sorts of things to make them more bird friendly. And, so this, this is the stuff that we learn, but we only learn it because you're telling us what you're seeing out there. That's why it's so important to have so many sets of eyes around the country. Now, this activity, the Aussie Backyard Bird Count, is part of the broader Bird Week, which is National Bird Week has been going since the Gould League started National Bird Day in 1909. And then BirdLife Australia, we, we decided probably in the 90s that we needed a Bird Week because you can't just celebrate birds in one day. And there's a range of activities that go on throughout local areas. Local bird life branches have lots of activities as well. And, and there's lots of other things like bird exhibitions. There's a fabulous one in Cairns at the moment with the, uh, with the art of uh, brilliant wildlife artist, Bill Cooper. And there's lots of things that go on there. And as part of Bird Week, we've got a lot of activities too from bird life, uh, including uh, we have, um, I, I might just, share the screen. I, was, I, I could go to the web page. Hang on. We, as I said, we have a really brilliant uh, amount of prizes this year for people who participate in the Aussie Backyard Bird Count. I'll just have a quick share of that screen. 
if you can see, these are some of our um, some of the prizes that we have this year uh, for, for people who submit counts. That you know, there's a pair, a new pair of Swarovski binoculars, which will bring the birds closer to you. I can highly recommend them. Uh, we have artworks from uh, Pete, Peter Cro Pete Cromer. We've got the wingspan board game with the Australasian extension, uh, the board game naturally named after the former magazine of Birds Australia, of which I edited. It was a, a nice tribute on their part to name the game after us. Uh, the fabulous Egg Picnic have got some of their, their brilliant prints up, up for prizes. Metal Bird we have these astonishing um, sculptures and, and wild scarves. So there is an enormous amount of... Uh, love to be shared around and things that you can get uh, by being part of the Aussie Backyard Bird Count this year. Uh, we also have a bunch of educational resources. Um, I think Joe jo will share that link with you in the chat. Uh, that's for teachers, but it's also for parents at home, um, teaching from home or grandparents. And that's one of the great things about the Bird Count. We found we've had a lot of feedback from Grandparents in particular who found this as a really great activity to do with their kids and speaking as somebody who's had their kids schooling from home for much of the last two years, I can tell you at this stage we're desperate to uh, get, get, get the kids outside and doing something different and it's a great opportunity to do that. Uh, also, we have, this is, this is a brilliant competition that we're, uh, that we're running. Um, it's, it's basically an online one. We want you to celebrate your love of Australian birds by having, uh, having a go at dressing up like a bird. And I'll share this screen with you. It's inspired by a wonderful person online. I won't share their name, just known as Aussie Bird Outfits. And um, hopefully you can, you can see that there. Uh, the Aussie Bird Outfit, it's basically, we, we want you to dress in, as a bird in your daily clothing and then take a photo of yourself and then share it with us uh, with the hashtag Aussie Bird Outfits and we will be giving prizes to, to the best of those. Uh, now, I can't, have I worked, have I, sh no, no, I have stopped sharing screen. Is that right? Can someone let me know? I think I've shared screen because I am back now. Yeah, you're back now, Sean. I didn't share the right screen, didn't I? Oh, I shared my desktop. Ah, oh, okay. Well, that's embarrassing. <laughs> Okay, I'll share that screen again. Screen two. Okay, can we see that now? Yep. So there we go. There's the that uh, that's the Aussie bird bird outfits screen. So we'll stop sharing that, and we're back in the room. And as you can see, this is my initial one. I'm going as a red-backed fairy wren, uh, and I'm sure you can do better. But I, I've got my eye on some of those those prizes. Um, we also, there, there's a bunch of quizzes that you can do uh, that, that depending on how, how engaged you are, you, you can uh, go check out what Aussie bird are you, that quiz. I, I did it myself and found out to my delight that I was a Regent honey eater, which is pretty much my favourite bird and one that BirdLife Australia has been working on for, for almost 30 years trying to prevent from come, becoming extinct. Uh, there's also the Aussie bird ID quiz where you can test your knowledge and, and another one to test your knowledge about Australian birds. Um, there is, I, I wanna leave some time for questions and we're almost out of time. So, uh, but one of some of the big questions we get, I will kick that, kick that off, um, is the people ask what, how we vet the data and what we do is we definitely make sure that the surveys that you enter do get vetted because we want to use this in a lot of our scientific work. But so we keep it separate to our regular on, ongoing monitoring. But we, we do have a number of volunteer vetters of bird experts in each state who will go through and make sure that uh, the birds that are claimed have been to be seen are what they should be. And, um, and, and so then that goes through quite a rigorous process, but we have to do it quickly. So we want to get the results out. So we do, we do make sure that we scrutinise it as much as we can. Um, we also, uh, another question that we often get is when you're doing a count in 20 minutes 
and you say you have a pair of, of galahs that, that, that fly through and then they come back, do you count those birds? Well, the answer is we have to leave it to your judgment but we don't want you to double count birds if you know that you've seen the same birds. Um, if you're not sure uh, and you think there, might, there, there are other galahs around and it could be a different pair, then by all means, we leave it to your judgment to count those. And I guess in the great, uh, in the washout of things, it probably, if you accidentally double count a bird, there's probably 10 other houses in your area that haven't counted at all. So, you know, it, it does wash out in, in the about overall in balance. And another thing we get asked a lot is people say they don't submit a count because they went out and they didn't see any good birds or didn't see any birds at all. That's actually really important to us, just as important as if you were seeing Regent honey eaters in your backyard. We need to know if you're out there and you're seeing what you consider un uninspiring birds, say a, a couple of sparrows or, you know, a common or Indian minor or just some, some feral, feral pigeons. We actually want to know what you're seeing. That's what this is about. And also, when you're doing monitoring, what we call null surveys are really important too, because it's just as important to know where the birds aren't as where the birds are. Now, if you've got other questions, we have an FAQ, Frequently Asked Questions, part on the website, on the aussiebirdcount.org website. Um, and we have that um, because... Before you, before you bombard our inbox with, with your questions, go and check there. It's, uh, people often forget to look there because if you've got a question coming up from doing a survey, chances are other people have also asked those questions. And with seven years of experience, that's the quickest way you can find out um, whether your question can be answered. Uh, we will keep going. I, I will see um, now how are we going to do this. I, I will check. I could see some questions coming in. Uh, so if you want to fire off your questions now, we'll try and get a few, as many as possible. We'll maybe go, give it an, another 10 minutes or so. I'll have a look, probably easiest actually, I'll just look on the chat to see what's come up. Um, it's probably things like, Sean, you've muted yourself accidentally. Um, okay. All right. I can only see a desktop, thanks. So, I'm just looking here. Oh, and great message there. Thank, thanks, Tavish. Saw a dusky wood swallow today at their school. That's awesome. They're one of, they're genuinely one of my favourite birds. They're the sweetest, soft, softest looking birds. Actually, I have the questions here, thanks to the brilliant James. Um, so, uh, yes, yeah, so, so Carol, I think I've covered that, that you can email your, your sightings uh, rather than doing the app. So that's absolutely fine to do that. And as uh, Joe pointed out, we can't accept paper forms mailed in this year because we just don't have the capacity to process them and go through them due to COVID restrictions in, that are still operating in Melbourne. And uh, I think I just answered your question there, Eleanor, about if you see zero birds, should you still submit the survey? It might seem counterintuitive, but yes, we absolutely want to know where the birdless areas are, as well as where the birdie areas are. Um, okay, so, uh, yes, a, a common question is, can I do more than one count? Absolutely. And we really encourage you, if you wanna get out and about during, during bird week, during the bird count, we would love to get all the sites that you are during the week and doing counts. I found in the past, remember when we could travel, I remember during bird week, I had to be at airports doing some traveling and I just in waiting for the, uh, waiting for the plane in the departure lounge, it was a great time to do a, uh, a backyard bird count. So it's amazing what you can see flying past at even an airport. Often it was a few swallows and starlings and things like that, but maybe a raven or a crow might be there, magpies, masked lapwings out on the airstrip. So yeah, wherever you go during that week, we would love to see what birds you're seeing. Um, yeah, and I think we've covered how you know that you're not doing seeing the same bird twice. I guess ultimately it's up to you. You'll get a feel for this. And the great thing doing a 20 minute count, and this is something that I really am reminded of every year, is I get a real thrill out of doing these counts, even though I'm you know, in lockdown in Melbourne, I've been in this, 
looking out at this backyard for most of the last 18 months, pretty much every day of the last 18 months, my suburban backyard has been my view. But actually doing a backyard bird count, something slightly different because you've set that time, 20 minutes, and it's amazing how you tap into the rhythms and the pulses of nature just in that 20 minutes, how you see different birds arrive and then leave and then what birds pop up when those other birds have left and how you can see a rhythm where, say, in my neighbourhood, we have noisy miners and how they'll disappear and suddenly other birds will appear and then the noisy miners will come back and then those ones will drop drop away, just melt away. It's, it's, it's a really fascinating and, and almost... Um, zen kind of thing to do to just be in the moment it be with nature even in your backyard for 20 minutes um i think we're i think i've answered all the questions that we've got if people want to put anything more in the chat uh quickly before we finish um okay uh oh, another question from eleanor uh if you see a bird that shouldn't be in your area like an escaped captive western rosella in melbourne will the app let you submit it the app will strongly suggest that you've made a, an error and ask you to reconsider, but it does happen. And yes, I've seen a Western Rosella in Melbourne, which is clearly an escapee because they don't come any closer to Melbourne than say Esperance. So uh, you can go through and override that and, and enter any bird that you like. And our vetters will pick that up. And who knows, you may end up getting an email from one of our vetters saying, you've got Western Rosella here. Did you mean Eastern Rosella? Uh, so put those in because that's, and also don't be shy about putting every bird you see in, even if they're introduced birds. I know there's an old school feeling that people used to never put introduced birds into their bird lists. That actually skews the data and we don't know the impact that introduced birds are having. So make sure that you count all, all the birds you see. And even if it is an escapee, you might be logging a, a new like the, the outlier of a new feral population that might establish. So those sorts of things can be really interesting. And uh, another one from Eleanor, if the birds don't land, just fly past, can you count them? Absolutely. Um, you know, the, the airspace in urban areas is a habitat and it's also, you know, it might be birds moving from one patch of habitat to another. So that can be really useful information. Basically, we don't restrict the size of the area that you count because people have different backyards and people are counting in different spaces. But as a rule of thumb, we would like you to actually be um, uh, not moving around too much because that tends to skew the data. And as you've got, we want you to bird uh, count the birds near the pin that you've dropped. So if you're out on a power walk and do 5Ks in uh, 20 minutes, then it's going to sort of not be as accurate for that, for that pin. So as a rule of thumb, basically we say, if any bird that you can see or hear from the location that you've put. So you can be very strict and count just the birds in your literal backyard, or it can be the birds you see or hear from when you're standing in your backyard or down the park or at the local school or wherever you're doing it. So definitely count um, birds that fly over and also birds that you can hear. If you can identify the call, that for most species of bird, that is uh, every bit as definitive in, in identifying them as, as the way they look. So definitely if you know the calls, then please um, include those birds that you've heard. Um, Uh, doo -doo -doo. Sorry, I'm not sure what Joe's saying. We don't have capacity for thousands of lists. I'm not sure what that one was in. <laughs> All right. Oh, okay, no, so yes, uh, I think that was in response. Can we just email a list to, um, to the Bird Week email? Um, no, we, as Joe's pointed out, and she is the one who has to answer those emails, uh, we just don't have the capacity in Bird Week. We, I think last year, last year we got over 10,000 emails in Bird Week alone. Um, and so it's very hard to get back to stuff. So we really need you to either enter your, uh, to enter your accounts either through the app or enter your account through the website itself in, in that way. So, so thanks. Thanks for that. Um, and uh, someone's got, is it best to do your daily count at the same spot at the same time? 
maybe maybe you want to mix it up and see what birds you get. You might get dif a different set of birds in the afternoon to early morning. That's entirely up to you. We're happy for whatever you want to share with us. And one thing that has popped up in the past is people have done a count on each day in their yard, and that's that's absolutely fine with us. But they've they've said we have a pair of say tawny frog mouths, but because they counted them on the first day, they don't count them on subsequent days. That actually impacts the data because one of the most essential things we want to get out of this is the reporting rates. That's how often people see a bird in out of all the people that are surveying. So if you've got tawny frog mounts every day it will, and you only include them on one out of seven counts, then the actual um, reporting rate for tawny frogmouth will be much lower than it really is. Um, so, so it is important to include every bird that you see or hear in every count that you do. Okay, we're still going. Um, yes, oh, okay. Um, question, scaly breasted lorikeets and rainbow lorikeets are often in mixed flocks. It's really hard to know how to count a tree full of them. How do we score these birds? That's, that's a really good one, a tricky one. A rule of thumb for counting flocks in general is uh, often they might go past too quickly. And what I've found when I've been doing surveys, especially for water birds and shorebirds, which are in massive flocks at times of thousands, is it's best to take a, if you can't count them all individually, there's too many as they fly over, is to count a unit. Um, if you've got time count to 100 and or if you've just, got a very short time, maybe count to 10, work out how much of the percentage of that flock those 10 birds take up. And then you can do it very quickly and go, well, there's 10 by 10 by 10 by 10, or, or if it's a big flock, 100 by 100, that's another 100 there, another 100 there. And you won't get exactly right. But if you went through that flock, it's amazing, and counted five times, you'd probably get five different answers if you were counting individually in it anyway. You won't get it, it's not entirely accurate, but we, we understand that when we're, when we're assessing that. In terms of a mixed flock, I think you need to make a fairly quick assessment as to the proportion. So you, you work out what looks like there's, you know, for every one scaly breasted lorikeet, there might be 10 rainbow lorikeets. So if you can do that quick calculation of 10 by 10 by 10, okay, there's 120 birds in that flock. It's a ratio of about one to 10, we'll say, We'll say, uh, um, you know, about roughly, you know, 108 rainbow lorikeets and 12 um, scaly breasted. I think my maths was right on that one. I'm sure you would get it uh, better. Uh, are we interested in night birds? Uh, you bet we are. They doing a count at night. Obviously, you're going to get a very low count, but we really are interested in finding out what birds are active at night. And it can be really important. We have a powerful owl project that's been running in Sydney for 10 years and is in Brisbane for a few and starting up in Melbourne. And getting sightings of powerful owls is, is really important for us. And also tawny frog mounds are a common night bird. Often people know where they are during the day, but if you, it, it'd be great to see how many um, night counts we get. And because you put the details of the times, then we can, we can assess that when it comes to working out reporting rates and our in the future, our scrutineers and our researchers will be able to go, well, we won't include the night counts when we're looking at day bird reporting rates, things like that. Yes, um, I think we've got, um, you can count a bird that you can see but can't hear. Uh, yes, I think we've, we've covered that. Uh, if you see a pelican by chance during your 20 minute, but not during your 20 minutes, can you count it? Uh, well, you, but no, basically, because we want to see the birds that you count in your 20 minutes. And it's always the right, the way, it's kind of like the sod's law of, of monitoring, that as soon as you finish your 20 minute allocated count, there'll be a new bird flying over that wasn't in your 20 minutes. Uh, if you really want to include it, then start a new count when you see that pelican flying over. And then you can, um, we can include it that way, but don't tack it in afterwards because it's not giving a true sample of what we were seeing. And the important thing is that we get people doing surveys in as similar a fashion as possible. So we know that we're comparing like with like um, rather than, um, you know, I think sometimes people occasionally will send us, 
what just one bird count, but it's it has something like 75 species in it. Uh, and we think basically they've done a week's worth of counting in perhaps multiple areas. And that actually doesn't become very useful for us because we know that we can't compare that type of count with the standard 20 minute count. Um, yeah, dead birds. I think, uh, I guess that's a tricky one. I suppose I'd leave that up to you. In, in a sense, yes, it, if there is a dead bird in your area, in your count zone, um, then I guess it was alive. Presumably it hasn't been deposited there by something else. So it was at some stage part of the AV fauna. We don't have the capacity to put notes on our survey, so you can't tell us it's a dead bird, but it's certainly a, a register that that bird existed in that spot. And if it's still present during the time, although I would, would say if you were counting a dead bird and you're doing multiple counts over the week, maybe not count the same dead bird. I think that might be a, a good way to go. Um, because especially if it's a dead bird, the, the example given here was a tawny frog mouth. But say if it was a powerful owl, which, which you found dead, which may, uh, may have been um, killed by secondary poisoning from, from catching a rat that had eaten the second generation rat poisons, which we've been campaigning against at, at BirdLife. Uh, if you were to include that powerful owl every day, we would suddenly think that this was a hotspot for powerful owls. And, uh, and so that again could, could skew the data. So perhaps for dead birds, we'll make the exception say just include them once on their, on their survey. Um, I think we've gone through most of, the, uh, most of the questions. I'll ask James and Joe, is there anything else you'd like me to cover before we finish up? I'll just wait. Uh, Joe has sent through, if you do need more resources, see in the chat there, um, to help identify your local bird. We've got a comprehensive, uh, <laughs> uh, we've got a comprehensive resource list based on location to help get you sorted. And in the app, this time around this year, you will get a lot more information of what's likely to be seen in your neighbourhood when you go to the find a bird section. Um, I think that's it. We're, we're almost up for the hour. So unless there's any more questions, pressing questions, I hopefully this has been of use to you. It's been great to see so many people logging on and hopefully this gives you an insight and, and that you'll be able to, uh, I know that we've got people from councils here and teachers here as well watching. So hopefully you'll be able to share what you've learnt tonight with, with fellow potential counters and we get a much bigger number of people counting and, and a much greater spread of our counts this year. So thank you very much. Thanks to James and for Joe for nursing me through this. And I really look forward to seeing your counts coming in on Monday and have a great bird week and a brilliant Aussie backyard bird count. Thank you, everyone. Cheers.